guys, Chris here. So, out on my vacation, been looking at plants a lot, but actually got a place I could slow down so I could show you guys some giant ragweed. And you can see, see this taller stuff back in here. This is, this is giant ragweed. So this will produce everything the same as common ragweed. You know, the, the oils in the seeds pound per pound are the same as soybeans. But giant ragweed, as the name says, it's a much bigger version of the common. So you will get more of what you need off giant ragweed. Looks very similar to cannabis, but it's not. Hey guys, Chris here. So, I've talked to you guys a little bit about sunflowers, and I showed you some sunflowers as they were young sunflowers. Now, we've got, there's quite a few different varieties, but there are two really common varieties that grow out here in the uh, no man's land area. And here's one of the, the smaller varieties here. You can see it's got that common sunflower look to it. But these are a little bit smaller variety. Now you see these unopened sunflower buds here? This is what I call prairie artichoke. And you can cook these just like you could any other type of artichoke. And, um, I mean, they're, they're okay. It's kind of an acquired taste, but heck, you can eat them, so. But I will bring you guys back here once I come across the taller common variety that we get growing out here. You can see a whole bunch of these smaller commons all through here. Very far, and I found another variety of sunflower for you. Right here. As you can see, that's where I was showing you those smaller ones. And this, uh, I believe the correct name is beach sunflower, but we've always called these cow pen sunflowers. You can find them growing around cattle pens a lot. Same with uh, cow pen daisies. Uh, it's very similar looking plant to those. All right guys, so here is the taller version that we get out here of the common sunflower strains. As you can see, much bigger leaves, much bigger flowers. But it is still another type of common. And you can even see the, the bigger size of your, your prairie artichokes here. As you can see how much taller these are and bigger compared to the uh, smaller commons I was showing you. Hey guys, so I'm still over by the large sunflowers and I wanted to show you another type of grass. Um, there's not many uses of this grass. I mean, you can eat the seeds as you could with any other grass. However, I do know the leaves have been used in the past as an aid in dieting. So they uh, basically infuse the leaves with water into a tea, essentially, and drink it, and it is a dieting aid. It helps when you're dieting. But I do know one thing that this grass has been used for for years and years and years, and it's kind of how, it's, how it got its name. So it's known as witch grass. And you can see it here. And you see these tails up here? similar to a witch's broom as well as witch grass it's, it's very stiff so what they did for hundreds of years is they would make brooms out of witch grass which is probably I'm probably 99.9% .9 sure that's where it got its name from but there's some witch grass for you so if you're ever out living in the bush and you need to make a broom here you go so here's another type of grass. Now there are many varieties of this grass and they grow all over the globe in one variety or another. But it's known as love grass. Um, there's 
greater love grasses and lesser love grasses, uh, African love grass. There's a whole bunch of different varieties, but it grows about everywhere. And here's what what some out here grows looks like. But you can, as most grasses, you can eat the seeds, make it into cordage. So it's got a few uses, as all grasses do. But that is some um, prairie love grass for you here. It likes to grow in loamy, sandy soils, which is what we have a lot of out here. So love grass get you in the mood. Hey guys. Um, so if you've watched any of my plant videos, you know I I routinely bring up yuccas and I just wanted to show you guys what the uh, the yucca fruits look like. You can see some up on right there. So you can't eat those. Um, I will tell you from experience they're uh, they're not the tastiest thing to eat but you can eat them. I mean they're okay. But those are the uh, the yucca fruits. And you would want to eat them before they dry up. I would personally try to eat them before they were like this. I mean you could still eat them here. They're just going to be a little tough. A little tough and stringy. I've uh talked to you guys about skunkweed before or um, sorry about the sun buffalo gourd and I think I see an old complete gourd here I wanted to show you guys I was telling you about the size of a baseball okay that's not quite the size of a baseball a little smaller but that's the general size they grow to Still not blooming out. The, uh, the skunkweed at my house is blooming out, but this out here isn't. But the skunkweed at my house also gets a little more. Out. That's what the uh, gourds. And when you find these when they are fresh, they're going to look very similar to a watermelon in the color. With some light, lighter streaks going down through them. But you don't want to eat these, they'll make you pretty sick. You can't eat the seeds if you're in dire need of some intake into your bellies. But I wouldn't recommend that unless you got a strong gut because they are very, very disgusting. The buffalo gourds. Hey guys, so. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about a plant that most people eat and know, and that's corn. Now, most people should know this, but I guarantee you a lot don't, that the natives of the Americas are the ones we owe our thanks for creating the corn that we eat today. Now, this corn is not even the same corn that they used. They used what they called maize, and it's a smaller version of this. And there's also a, a type of corn called Indian corn, which is uh, bigger than maize, but it's, it's different. It's more of a corn that you would dry and use to make flowers and such. Now, just like wheat, okay? So, say something happens where there's not mankind taking care of these crops anymore. Corn, as we know it today, will die out. There's too many kernels on one cob. They all fall, they all fight, they choke themselves out. Corn would die off. Now, what a lot of people don't know is maize is actually not a native species as well. It was created from and I can't remember the name of the original plant, but plant, but it's basically a grassy shrub from Central and South America. And 
it probably took ancient man at least a thousand years to create maize from that grass seed. And I will put a picture of what that plant looks like up right now. Okay, and here's a picture of what maize looks like. Here's a picture of what Indian corn looks like. And today's corn. So, a little neat fact about corn. So say we were to let the corn die out to where we had to recreate it from the original grass plant like our ancestors did. In my opinion, mankind, modern man, does not have the patience to go through a, at least a thousand year period to turn a grass seed into maize. Um, I don't think we have that amount of patience, modern man. And that's just my personal opinion. The ones who are left, they may have the patience to do it again. But luckily there's a lot of seed banks and a lot of people store seeds. So hopefully we never have to recreate corn like our ancestors did. So that's just a little, little bit of history on corn. Another grass that I've already talked about. I just want to show you it at its an adult stage and I see another plant that I get to talk about here in a second. But foxtail grass. Now you can really see what I mean about it looking like a foxtail. Real fluffy. You can see all the little seeds down in there. And these hairs are what you want to make sure you get out because if you get those in your teeth, I guarantee you it will stay there for a very long time. I had one I had two months of messing with at least before I got it out of my mouth. But that's foxtails grass. And it makes some good cordage when you twist it. Or not twist it, when you uh, braid it. Hey guys, so I don't think you guys have this plant back east, but out here in the uh, the Midwest and West, this is an extreme nuisance plant. Everybody hates this plant. I've got to dig it out of my dogs right now, but out here we call it sandburrs. So you can see sandburrs all through here. It's a type of grass. It's just over time developed little burrs here so that it can replant itself all over the place, which is what it does excellent. But back to the sand burrs. So I just cut off with butt. All right, so what I was gonna say is about these sand burrs. What a lot of people don't know about sand burrs well, one, you can make cordage out of them, just like all other grasses. But these seed pods up here with the pricklies on there, you can actually eat these things. So, there's two ways that I know that you can eat these. One way <clears throat> is why they're still green like this, is you can pick these things and you can boil them and that will soften them up. And then what you would have to do is get the seed out from inside. The other way to eat these is to let these dry and then get the seed out. And you can grind it up like you would all other grass seeds and add it to flowers and things. But those are sand burrs. So, Here's a plant and there's, there's about, I don't know, 
150, 200 different species, or not species, but different relative or strain of this plant just here in uh, the Great Plains. Um, this is a plant you can find all over the planet. There are tons of different varieties of it. Um, so it's got an edible quality as well as a couple of medicinal qualities. Now you can take um, you can take the leaves and the juices of this plant and use those to help relieve headaches and stomach issues, you know, like stomach cramps or upset stomach, um, as well as using that to help in dressing wounds. So if you've got a cut or something, it'll help keep that from getting infected. Um, the edible qualities of this, um, it puts on little fruits. Now these fruits you do not want to eat when they are not ripe because they can be somewhat toxic and they can make you a little sick. So you want to make sure these ripen up. Now depending on the variety, and most varieties have leaves around them, um, once those leaves have browned up, the, the fruit will turn an orangish or yellowish color and they're edible then and you can cook them as well and they're known as wild tomatoes or uh, the, the versions we get here they're more of a wild tomatillo but yeah I'll show them to you so that's all these this is wild tomatoes now I don't think I've got any blooming Here's some, oh, here we go. All right. Now here you can see the sack around there. So just like a tomatillo. So there's gonna be a little green ball in here. Right now it's probably about the size of a small pearl. But that will um, get to about the size of a cherry. That's why this plant is also known as ground cherry because they're little cherry looking things but when they're ripe you can eat them and they taste like tomatoes to me but this is a uh, this is one type of wild tomato plant or um, wild tomatillo oh you like most plants you can make cordage out of the fibers in the stalks of tomato plants and all the wild varieties as well Guys, so I found this plant a while back and I wanted to talk to you guys about it. I haven't had time to come way up here. But um, around here we call it skunk bush. I think it's also known as skunk berry or squaw bush, I believe. But it has a lot of medicinal purposes as well as a few edible purposes. And this is what the plant looks like. And so it gets these berry clusters on it. And those berries you can eat raw as well as cook them. But however, you do not want to boil the berries from this plant because when you boil them, they release tanning agents. And you don't want to be ingesting tanning agents. So um you can make this plant is very astringent so you can make poultices and such for snake bites and wounds as well as this plant can help in the aid of head colds you can make uh, cold drinks and such from the fruits you can chew on the bark and swallow the juices to help with stomach problems or sore gums or toothaches um, the roots, you can make a tea from the roots and the, the bark and that is, uh, that will help with head colds and things. Um, I do believe that the natives used this plant. They made some type of concoction from it and they used it in the helping of the release of placentas in women that were, had just given birth. Uh, there's quite a few other uses. I'm not going to cover them all. I can't ever remember them all. There's too many. But this is skunk bush. 
skunkberry or squabush. Found some squabush that either looks, yeah, looks like it has berries. Nope, they're the blooms. Well, well, yeah, they are the berries. See what I was talking about? Them having these clusters on them there. Now, I do, I did fail to mention one thing about skunk bush that I would like to mention. Uh, use extreme caution when messing with this plant. You know, don't overtake the dosages that you need because in high quantities, this plant can be somewhat toxic. Um, so just use some caution and make sure that you, you know what parts of the plant you're using for what and how much to use of it. So this is one of those plants I've tried the berries before but I don't mess with because of all the uh, toxic qualities this plant contains. But it's still a good plant to know. You know, if you get caught out in the bush, I'd rather know about this plant than not know about it. One thing I forgot to mention as well about the berries from this plant. So you can dry these, grind them up, add them to flowers and things, or when they're fresh, you can make jams and jellies from these berries as well. Hey guys, so here's a animal that is very common out here in the short grass prairies, and that is the box turtle. So, cool thing about a box turtle, and this is why you never want to pick up a box turtle. So, a box turtle, if you move it, it will spend its entire life trying to get back home. They just know. I don't know if it's due to the magnetism or, or what, but they will spend their entire lives trying to get back home. I'm going to chase this one back across this way because that's the way he was going. But, uh... Now, so on box turtles, the males will have a longer tail and they will most generally have red eyes. Your females will have a lighter colored eye. And in the winter, box turtles, they can dig down to, oh, about two foot down in the winter to hibernate. So a box turtle during the wetter times of the year, that is breeding season. And they will travel upwards of, you know, even 50 miles to get back to the breeding ground where they hatched out so that they can breed and put more eggs out. Um, box turtles are becoming extinct. There's not much out here that can eat a box turtle. However, coyotes are extremely smart, one of the smartest predators on earth besides us and they can actually they'll work at a box turtle enough they can get in and eat the box turtle but really out here in the uh, grasslands the biggest predator to the box turtle is mankind and that's for two reasons one running them over on the roads and two picking them up and taking them long distances from their homes and they will actually die trying to get back to their home if they've, you know, gone too far from it or not. But, very interesting creatures. I love box turtles. You can see they, this is the common pattern of the box turtle. One other thing on the box turtles. So, when box turtles are young, they mainly eat protein, so bugs, insects, and such. Um, as they're around their middle age, they have a mixed diet of half herbivore, half carnivore, and then the adult box turtles mainly only eat plants. So they, over the course of their life, they go from a 100% carnivore to basically a 100% herbivore. Guys, I just drove by and I saw some broadleaf milkweed over here. Um, now, most milkweeds, 
Uh, they can be kind of really bitter and a little bit toxic. Uh, basically, the only way to eat a milkweed is to boil them, and it gets rid of that toxic stuff that's in the sap and in the milk and stuff. But um, the broadleaf milkweeds are extremely bitter. I I wouldn't recommend eating them, but I'm going to show them to you guys because they can be edible. You know, cooking them. You always with the milkweeds. You want to find the young shoots. Uh, those are going to be better. They're going to have less of the toxin. They're going to be less bitter, and um, they're just going to taste better all around after you boil them. Um, somewhat asparagusy almost, but um, the broadleafs they're bitter. They're just plain bitter. But here's a a little bit older one here. And this one would have been a lot taller because you can see it's been it's been mowed over. Um, but the leaves, they're very big, if you notice that compared to other milkweeds. But this is native to the short grass prairies. At least in western Kansas, eastern Colorado, um, northeast New Mexico, panhandle area. Odd leaf milkweed. Hey guys, so I showed you the broadleaf milkweed. I wanted to show you a nice specimen of some broadleaf milkweed. So if you look, it's all growing from the same general crown down there. see the, the blooms of this stuff and how big the leaves are but that's broadleaf milkweed an uncut specimen hey guys so I found another type of sweet clover now uh, this does not have a white flower this does not have a yellow flower like uh, your normal sweet clovers you'll see the more common one. It's got a yellow flower um, And then depending on your region you'll have some that are white flowered, but this is The real name I can picture it. It's Who who bought who bam who bomb I think is the real name of this type of sweet clover, but it's got a light purpley colored flower and you can do with this stuff just as you can any other sweet clover. But another thing I wanted to show you, pretty cool, is here you can see some. Uh, we call them stick bugs. You can see it right there. There's a brown one. Here's a smaller one over here. There's a brown one on top of a green one. I guess they're mating, possibly. Yep, you can see their tails. Let me find them on the phone again. If you follow their tails down, you might not be able to see it on camera, but their tails are interlocked. There's a big green one. A whole bunch of them on this. But this is a Tsubam or Hubam sweet clover find this more in um, some sandier deserty type soils hey guys I think you can see their tails a little better see them interlocked right there so those two are mating hey guys so here's a plant I've been looking for ever since I started recording the plant stuff and I came over here to look at a different plant just to check it out some uh, um, sweet clover down over there but as I was walking back I saw some Western ragweed and it's very similar to common ragweed it's just a more deserty strain I guess that you'll find further out west but here's some, um, some Western ragweed right here there's a young one right there 
but you can see it looks very similar to common ragweed but it's uh, slightly different but has retains many of the same qualities you know um, pound per pound the seeds are excellent sources of oil and fat well pound per pound they're the same as soybeans so I just wanted to show you guys a more mature uh, western ragweed plant there you can see it there there's actually quite a few of them but western ragweed as I wanted to show you another type of thistle um, uh, it's just a prairie type of thistle as you can see it here This is starting to get more mature, so it's starting to, the stems are starting to change to a more of a purplish, reddish purple type color. Um, and it does have some th little spines on it, like uh, most thistles do. But this one is one I usually only see out in old prairie grounds. It's a uh, cousin to Russian thistle a uh, close cousin to it oh but like most thistles you know they are edible the inside shoots here you want to get the the fibrous layer off the stalks and then get to that meat or that soft uh, plant tissue on the inside and that's what is edible hey guys um, I found a type of sorghum growing over here it's uh, Sedong grass and you know it can be used as animal feed as well as you know like most grasses the seeds we can add to flower and such but here's here's what it looks like it's got some long long wispy leaves on it the stalks on this stuff get pretty thick and of course up here is where your seeds would be Sedan grass, so in the sorghum family. Hey guys, so here's a pretty neat plant. It's got a lot of medicinal purposes as well as some edible purposes. Now, as far as I know, there's, there's basically three different types of this plant. Um, the biggest version is a shrub type that puts on some red berries. Um, then there's another version it's a little bit smaller but it's it's got some more of a silvery looking leaf to it and then there's this version of this plant and this version is a lot smaller uh, it grows out here in the west it still puts the berries on but they're not red in color they're more of a light yellowy color um, almost you almost looks like you could see through them almost um, but this plant is known as buffalo berry and a lot of you hear the name buffalo berry and you probably think of that shrub you know it can get I don't know about four or five foot tall or so puts on red berries all over um, those berries you can use to make dyes you can eat them you can make jams with them um, as far as medicinally oh, it's been used everything from headaches to arthritis to sores to help you know broken bones um, they uh i do know there's another name for buffalo berry and it's soap berry now the reason it's called soap berry so the indians actually used to make a drink too using the same properties but when you add these berries to water when they're crushed up they create this kind of frothiness on the top almost like soap suds well the natives used to take and they would take hot water and they would beat up buffalo berries and just beat them up and stir the water and stir the water and they'd make this kind of frothy drink um, I've heard it called Indian ice cream before um, I doubt it was an actual ice cream I'm pretty sure it's just kind of a thick frothy drink but very healthy very good for you but I'll show you the uh, buffalo berry that we get out here blooms with the yellow flower there's quite a 
few of them in through here. But if you notice on the buffalo berry out here, like most plants out here, they've got spines on them. And there's a good reason that most plants out here in the west have spines. Um, this was grazing territory, you know, this is where all the buffalo grazed and all the herbivores prior to the buffalo. So a lot of these plants have adapted over time to have spines on them. That way they're just not getting ate by every animal that comes along to eat them. But that is buffalo berry. The smaller version, the, uh, the western version. Buffalo berry, all three species of buffalo berry are native to the U.S. Do some pigweed in another video and I want to show you some young pigweed. Um, as you know, you know certain parts of the pigweed are edible and you can use it medicinally. Uh, the seeds mainly is what you would want to use from pigweed. But here is some younger pigweed right here. This here and this here. Right there. So I'm getting a little bit older. You can see this one's starting to get the uh, fluffy seed top on it. And these will have a bunch of these by the time it's done. And to collect these, you would just grab your hand on them like this and pull. And they'll all fall out right there in your hand. That's some young pigweed there. Hey guys, so I also wanted to show you another plant I've talked about. And that was Mexican fireweed, which I used the uh, more correct term for it, which was summer cypress in the last video. But I wanted to show you this plant as it's more mature, it's starting to flower out, which is where you would get those little fruits I was talking about that you could eat. Um, but remember with summer cypress, you know, the young shoots, young leaves are edible, but there's not much you really want to mess with on it because it can be somewhat toxic. So this is one of those I wouldn't really mess with unless you're in dire need of some calorie intake. Uh, but on the adult plants, there's not anything you can really eat besides the fruits they put on. And these aren't even fruiting out yet, but they are starting to bloom. And I'll show you. These are pretty well adult fireweed plants or summer cypress. Mexican fireweed, excuse me. And you can see there, they're starting to get those nice fluffy tops up there, which means they're getting ready to start blooming out. One interesting thing about this plant, um, a lot of you guys know what tumbleweeds are, right? Well, there you go. There's green tumbleweeds for you. Hey guys, so I wanted to show you a plant. It doesn't have any edible qualities. It can actually be pretty toxic if you eat it. But the natives used to use this plant as a broom, as well as the reason we call it snakeweed out here is because they used to use it in the treating of snake bites and similar type wounds, you know, stings and such. And so it's called snakeweed broom out here. Very closely related to Spanish broom. Blooms yellow just like Spanish broom. It's just a little bit smaller of a version. It doesn't get as big as some of the Spanish blooms I've seen. This is what this plant looks like. And I was talking to you guys about tumbleweeds. Here is another plant that will become a tumbleweed once it's dried and detached from the soil. Hey guys, so some of you may have noticed a plant in some of my videos that I haven't talked about yet. And this plant is known as the sawtooth daisy, or at least that's what I call it. It's got, I think, four names. Um, so, it's not really an edible plant, but it is somewhat medicinal. So it's been used in the treatment of whooping cough and bronchitis and asthma. It's, uh, it's got kind of a calming effect or a soothing effect on the heart muscle. So it's, it's good on that or, you know, uh, emphysema. It's 
used in to help treat emphysema. So this is one of the coolest things about this plant and it's the one thing I remembered for years and years over all the other stuff and that's that you can use it as a topical treatment on the skin for burns, rashes, as well as it's a natural treatment for poison oak and poison ivy, which is one of the coolest things about this plant. Um, it's, uh, it's part of the gum plants. Um, so it, it releases this kind of gummy toxin to it. Uh, smells kind of skunky, doesn't smell very good. You can use that glue as a makeshift sealant for things you know and it's not gonna work great but it will work better than not using it and I'll show you what this plant looks like and you may recognize it from seeing it in some of the other little clips on this video and this is when you can see why they call it sawtooth daisy it's got another name too and I don't use this name because this name is also used for another plant. I was talking to you guys about Spanish Bloom. Okay, Spanish Bloom is also known as Spanish Gold. Well, Sawtooth Daisy, one of the other names for Sawtooth Daisy, is Spanish Gold. And up here at the top, and on these here, these side leaves, side shoots, that's where you'll get the flowers. And then the flowers are a yellowish color, kind of a deep yellow. Um, a couple uses that I've learned about this plant, messing with it. One, it makes some halfway decent cordage. The fibers here inside the stalks, they make halfway decent cordage. Um, as well, as when this plant is fully dried, it'll get, so you know, sometimes it can get up to three foot tall. And when it's fully dry, if you can find some that have thicker stalks on them, if you're careful with it, you can use this as a hand drill if you can find some that are pretty straight. I've got that to work one time. I only tried it once, so maybe I should try it a couple more times to make sure it's gonna work every single time. But I do know when I was using it, I had a problem with the tip down on my hearth board the tip would kind of break away sometimes so I had to prepare my end to where it would work to get my ember going. But this is the sawtooth daisy or Spanish gold. So I also wanted to add this little bit. So in a lot of my videos you may see a bunch of plants like the sawtooth daisy that I don't talk about. Now there's a good reason me not talking about some of these plants some of them and quite a few of them I don't actually know what they are or any uses for them there's a very good reason for that so out here in the west in the short grass prairies if you know anything about history out here the Europeans were fighting the natives a lot longer than they were anywhere else in the US so in other areas of the US the Europeans had more time to learn the plants and such and the uses of those plants from the natives. Well, out here in the short grass prairies, they were constantly fighting. You know, the natives were raiding the wagon trains and they were, you know, um, raiding the settlers' homes and such. So we did learn some of the more common plants from the natives of this area but due to the history there's a lot of traditional prairie flowers and things that there is no known use for it's kind of sad when you think about it because thousands and thousands of years of knowledge is lost lost for good here showing you another grass but of course live in the grasslands so this is known as blue stream grass or silver blue stream you can see it all through this ditch here and one thing that's a telltale sign of silver blue stream is this soft fluffy top where the seeds are and as most grasses 
you can eat these seeds as well as turn it into cordage. There's not much else you can do with this. This is a excellent erosion control grass. Silver blue stream.